Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Deakin University's Optometry Alumni Webinar, Working with Ophthalmology, and welcome to our presenters, Dr. Ahmed Hassan, Mr. Lewis Curry, and Ms. Natalie Buckman. So I'm Ashta Sliwa, one of the committee members of the Deakin University Alumni Chapter, and today we'll be broadcasting live with the Alumni Committee, which includes Nick, my fellow presenter, and our amazing co-presidents, Amanda Edgar and Zara Deneshva, and our fellow committee members, Ash Chan, Jesse Wiley, and Brianna Caldo. <clears throat> so as we gather for this meeting physically and dispersed virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect the meaning of place and doing so recognize the various traditional lands on which we are business today. <clears throat> we acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of, of all the land and we work live and on on their ancestral spirits with gratitude and respect. Hi everyone, so my name's Nick. Thanks so much for that, Ashta. Uh, so for those watching uh, and those who couldn't make it to today's webinar, um, you may have heard this will be recorded and also will be posted online on the Deakin Alumni website under webinar and resources. Before we get started, you may notice that your microphone has been muted for the duration of the presentation. We encourage all participants to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions uh, to the presenters, and this will be answered at the end of the presentations. If time doesn't allow for this, don't worry, these questions will be answered and posted in the box for everyone to see as well. So please remember that your attendance for the entirety of the webinar is important, and it's also being monitored to claim your CPD points. Tonight, just for watching the webinar, you will get two hours of CPD. Uh, please notice that there is a link to a Qualtrics survey, which we will send at the end of the presentations for you to fill out. And that has some feedback and also your, if you can put in your OA number as well to be eligible for the CBD points. So welcome to the sixth Optometry Hour alumni webinar, Working with Ophthalmology, where we are connecting with alumni and friends across the country. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers for taking time out of their day to present and share their experiences with us. We are proud to have our first speaker today, Dr. Ahmed Hassan. Dr. Hassan is an ophthalmologist with 15 years of experience um, as an ophthalmology consult at Monash Health. He has a broad experience in cataract surgery, general and pediatric ophthalmology, having conducted pediatric eye outpatient at Monash Medical Center for over five years. A lecturer in ophthalmology at Monash University Medical School, Dr. Hassan trains Ransko surgical trainees at Monash Health, and he also consults at Dandenong Eye Centre and Bass Coast Eye Centre. Thanks, Ash. <laughs> I'll just get the um, slideshow ready, and I'll try and share my screen. Here we go. Oh, pardon me, I think I just gave away the um oh, here. how's that? Is that working now? That looks great. So I'll be speaking, my name is Ahmed Hassan. I work in Dandenong. I'm a consultant at Monash Health. And I also go to the country um, in Wonthaggi. So I'll speak about a couple of very memorable cases that will probably, yeah, two of the most memorable cases I've seen over the last 15 years. And then we'll just have a very basic recap of um, pediatric ophthalmology, uh, more of a opportunity, I guess, for you to, um, uh, you know, just have any of your questions answered. I'll also just get, briefly mention my approach to patients who walk in with visual snow. Okay, so the first memorable case was a 65 year old man who had a very red unilateral eye for about nine months and he had glaucoma in that eye. There was no pain, 
and um, the optic nerve was definitely more capped on the side with the big pressure. On examination, he had very prominent vessels on that eye. And there was a little bit of maybe proptosis, maybe not. And he had unilateral glaucoma and the AC was quiet because usually if you have a red eye with glaucoma, immediately you're thinking of uveitic glaucoma. So any thoughts about that? So this was a carotid cavernous fistula. So carotid cavernous fistula is um, pretty rare. I've only ever seen one. I'd read about it for our exams, but yeah, it was the first one I'd actually seen. There are two types. This gentleman had a low flow carotid cavernous fistula. The high flow ones, as in that fella up the top corner there, are you know, exceedingly rare and they're not coming to, to your practice or my practice, they're going straight to hospital. If they have a high flow carotid cavernous fistula, they've got a shocking headache, their eyes are about to pop out of their head. You know, it's, it's a big deal. So a high flow one means that there's a big tear in the carotid artery where it's traveling through the cavernous sinus and then all that arterial blood just gushes back through the veins into, the, into all the veins of the eye and the orbit congesting the entire orbit and pretty much cutting off the circulation to the eye. In a low flow one, there's just a tiny little crack in the carotid artery and a little bit of arterial blood's just, just going back through, through the veins. So of course, if the veins are all full of arterial blood coming back in the other direction, then the aqueous humor can't get out because aqueous Schlem's canal just drains into the episcleral vein. So if they're all if, they're all, if they've all got arterial blood coming back the other direction, then no aqueous can drain out. There's just too much pressure for, and then the eye just builds up. Uh, the intraocular pressure just builds up. So this gentleman, um, he was a bit taken aback when I made the diagnosis and told him what it is and that he'd have to go to the neurosurgery department at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and that they're going to have to stick a coil in his neck and into his brain. So it, it, it actually it was a bit of a hard sell because the old fellow, his English wasn't that great. And, you know, I'm trying to explain this whole scenario to him. And he was a stoic old East European gentleman. And I think he thought it was all a bit of a joke that, you know, I've just got a bit of a red eye. He can't even feel the pressure of 30. He's got to just take my word for it that his optic nerves, you know, going downhill. He can still see six, nine or something like that and they're going to go start putting wires into his head. Fortunately, he, um, you know, his family and everybody agreed to go along with it. And he did go to the Royal Melbourne. And I had a few stressful weeks wondering how he's going to come back. Because of course, with these interventions, they're putting a coil through his aorta, through his femoral artery, up his aorta, right up into his carotid artery. It's a big deal. And then they put a little titanium coil in there to, to um, form a clot and pretty much plug up that little tear. And sure enough, it worked very well. And he came back with a nice wide eye. The pressure had gone back down to normal and he didn't need any glaucoma drops. So that's, that's, that's a low flow carotid cavernous fistula, which is a pretty rare thing, but yeah, very interesting. This case, uh, I'll always remember, I was a pretty young consultant and this lady, she was in her 30s, very intelligent IT worker. You know, um, she, she came in with a very distinct and detailed history of this curved shadow in, in her vision, and she was pretty myopic. So, of course, I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be a retinal detachment, a small one. I looked at the retina, looked fine. So I, I brought her back in a couple of weeks to see my retinal colleague in the same practice, to just maybe have a look around the corners and see if he can spot a little one right at the edge with some scleral indentation or something like that. But he, can, he wrote back saying everything's fine, normal. So I told her to you know, come back if anything changes. She came back a couple of months later and she had this, she said, look, it's definitely there. And it's when I look in a certain direction, when I look you know, in one particular direction, it, I can see it. When I look the other way, it's not there. 
So then I thought, well, maybe it's optic neuritis because of her age. You know, optic neuritis can produce some pretty funny symptoms, but she was still 6'6", six, six, and, it, you know, the pupils looked okay. So I wasn't that convinced about it, but I thought, okay, well, we'll just send her for an MRI to just make sure the optic nerve's okay. And I'm still just thinking of retina or optic nerve, as we all do. Her fields, we did visual fields, they were normal. So again, it doesn't fit with optic neuritis. No red desaturation, color vision's normal. No discomfort. So we did the MRI and there was a mass in the lacrimal gland. It was indenting the globe. So that was her problem. So when she looked up towards the lacrimal gland, it would indent the globe and distort the retina and she was aware of that. It's a pretty unusual presentation because normally lacrimal gland tumors uh, present with an abnormal eyelid contour. That's the typical thing we look for or we think of. So you'd see this, um, if you look at that picture of the fella down there, he's, the, uh, the normal eyelids curved up like an arch, the upper lid, but the other ones, he's got this little dip laterally, or it's a, dro a bit droopy laterally compared to medially. And um, there's a fullness in the upper lid, which she didn't have. I guess her eyes were pretty big and, and it must've been a smallish tumor. So I sent her to um, an orbital surgeon in the city and he wrote back saying, oh, it's probably a pleomorphic adenoma, which is a benign tumor. So the commonest thing would be a benign tumor, similar to a pituitary adenoma, the same sort of thing, where it never kills anyone. It's just, um, you know, a benign tumor, and then they just cut it out. So he said, probably a pleomorphic adenoma. That's the commonest thing. We'll do a biopsy. But then he sent me a letter after that saying that it was actually a carcinoma. And that's probably why it presented this way, because Cancers are hard. And, and just a little practice tip, by the way. Um, once I was at a conference and there was an oculoplastic surgeon from America and he was talking about BCCs on the eyelid. And he said, there's something they teach dermatologists that they don't teach us eye people. And that's that cancer is always hard. If you pick up a cancer between your fingers, it's as hard as a rock. And it makes sense because it's hypermitotic. You've got two or three times as many cells as you should because of all the mitosis. So they're very dense and very hard. So if you pick up, if you've got something on the island, you're trying to figure out, is this a meibomian granuloma, an old meibomian cyst that ruptured and just a little bit of scar tissue left over, or is it actually a BCC? If you just pick it up between your fingers and just roll it around, you'll see that it's it, if it's soft, it's probably not a cancer. If, if it's hard, it is. So. This must have been a very small lump in her orbit, but because it was a cancer, it was so hard that whenever the eye bumped into it, it would distort the um, sclera and the retina pretty significantly producing these visual symptoms, which are a pretty unusual presentation. So she went through a pretty um, uh, drastic procedure. She went to the, the orbital surgeon couldn't deal with it. He sent her straight to the big cancer hospital in Melbourne. And not only an enucleation, so there's evisceration where they take out the inside of the eye but leave the sclera there. Then there's an enucleation, for example, in a melanoma um, or a very blind, if there's a, a choroidal melanoma, for example, they'll do an enucleation where they remove the eye, but they leave the extraocular muscles and everything else. Then there's an exenteration where they actually removed the entire contents of the orbit. So they had to remove the cancerous lacrimal gland and some of the bone of the orbit, the eye, all the extraocular muscles, everything. And then you're left with this skin flap, skin transplant, just to sort of cover up the defect. And then they drill some little um, pegs into the superior orbital margin and you just plug. So that picture in the bottom corner is like the, where the which plugs into the those clips that are at the top this isn't my patient but it's a very similar scenario and um yeah and then they make a prosthesis the prosthesis that has the eye the lids the lash all made out of silicon and various other things to to look as close as possible and then they get the patient to wear glasses probably with a bit of tint to try and you know make it not so obvious so 
this, this patient up here is wearing her prosthesis and she's probably put a bit of makeup and foundation to sort of cover it up, but they can do a pretty good job, you know, considering it's such drastic surgery. Okay, you may or may not have seen some of these young fellas walk into your consulting room. So every, maybe once a year, I'll have usually it's a teenage guy who comes in and says, oh, yeah, I've got this symptom. And first, the way he's talking, you think it's going to be a visual migraine. I've got these little dots everywhere, especially if I'm looking at a plain background. But then, of course, the main question is, well, okay, well, how long do they last? If it's 20 minutes, yeah, sure, it's a visual migraine. But then this patient will tell you they're there all the time. So I'll ask them, can you make yourself see it anytime you want? He goes, yep, here it is. I'm looking at it now. So you, you may or may not have had these patients yet, but um, they're certainly out there. So my approach when I have a patient with this, and, and you'll do the exam and everything's normal. Perfect vision, cornea is beautiful, lens is beautiful. There's nothing to see. So when I have a case like that, basically it's... Um, Entoptic phenomena. So if you just Google, you know, and you probably remember it from uni as well, entoptic phenomena, it's just, so I'll, I'll just say to the kid, look, welcome to the matrix. You've seen behind the scenes. You're able to um, perceive some of the inner workings of your eye. There are little electrical signals between the cells and little cells that are walking around mopping up that you're actually just um, watching, but it's mainly the electrical signals of the retinal cells that you, you're appreciating. And I told him I can see it too. Like if, and I think all of us, if we sort of just zone out a bit and just look at a blank wall, you, you'll just be aware of these little fuzzy bits going everywhere, um, which are just the inner workings of the retina. Having said that, when I was preparing this talk, so that's my usual spiel. And then I tell them that there's nothing wrong with your eyes everybody has this it's just that you're particularly observant and congratulations for being so you know observant that you can notice it but there's nothing wrong with your eyes and yeah there's no treatment necessary for this and then I'll just write on a piece of paper and toptic phenomenon and say go google it having said that when I was preparing this talk and then I was looking into it a bit further there are actually now you know Facebook support groups and patient support organizations and there's a bit of literature about it mostly from neurologists not from ophthalmologists so the neurologists are probably perplexed by all of this maybe they never learned about entoptic phenomena but look maybe there's more to it that I'm not aware of but that's my usual spiel and, and that's my approach to such patients and while we're on um, interesting cases I didn't add it to the PowerPoint, but I had one just this week. And um, this is a totally separate topic before we go to the pediatrics. And that was, I had a lady, she's about 40 something, walk in with vision of 612 minus, and she just failed her Vicro. She's a new arrival in Australia from India, and she was going for her driver's license, and she failed her um, Vicro's test. She was plano. The autorefraction was plano. The retinoscopy was plano. The lens was clear. The retina was beautiful. Optic nerve looked great. Everything looked fine. Visual fields, normal. So I'd had another case like this who was 660. And, and it basically, cut a long story short, it was a, and the OCT was normal, except maybe the nerves were a little bit full, a bit swollen. So I was starting to think now optic nerves. And then basically, cut a long story short, it was a nutritional optic neuropathy. So some people for religious reasons are very strict vegetarian. So I was asking, do you take any you know, vitamin supplements? Do you, um, so some very strict vegans who won't eat any animal products, if they're not taking vitamin supplements or things like that, they can get a severe B12 deficiency. And I'd had another patient like that um, who was 660 with bilateral swollen discs, and she was about 40 as well. And the neurologist, so I sent her to neurology thinking it was idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but she was very slim and she didn't fit the typical IIH patient profile. Um, and the neurologist was clever enough to pick it up and he started at her, he started her on vitamin B 
supplements and she came back from 660 to 66 in each eye and her nerves were perfect. And I'm sure this patient will be the same. So I've actually didn't even bother with the neurologist this time. I just sent her straight to the GP and just prescribed some um, multivitamin B tablets and get her back in a month to see how she's recovering. So it is worth asking the question if the patient's a very strict vegan, if you have a bilateral optic neuropathy, because a lot of these toxic slash nutritional optic neuropathies we think of, you know, being on ethambutol with TB medication or in alcoholic people, I've seen a couple of them over the years where they're just neglecting themselves and just too much grog, too many smokes and not a good diet, then sure, you can get this toxic, they're the typical toxic slash nutritional optic neuropathy, but there's also a demographic of, you know, um, very strict vegetarians who can get that and just keep that in mind as well. So there's some of the things out of left field that pop up sometimes. Okay, so we'll get to pediatric ophthalmology. Um, so amblyopia, as you all know, you know, the commonest causes are uneven refraction and strabismus. By the way, I'm not really seeing the questions. I better double check. I'll just check this little box down here to see if there's any. Um, uh, someone's asking, how do we make a correct diagnosis when the cases are rare? Well, it's just exclusion and just something in the memory banks, hopefully just, yeah, in that particular case with the carotid cavernous fistulas, it was the redness of the blood, the conjunctival vessels, they, it was like bright red and they didn't look like veins. They just, they were just bright red vessels on the ocular surface and they were sort of corkscrew. They were, so just something just in the memory banks from when we did our exams just you know, just popped up saying, okay, corkscrew vessels, too bright arterial. It just, yeah, just, I thought that's what it might be. And, and yeah, so um, amblyopia, as we can um, all attest, is quite a challenging thing. If it's a mild one, it's very hard to convince them to do the patching, but we do our best. And even if it's a dense one, even if they do do the patching, then it's often, you know, not that fantastic. The vision will still be, you know, maybe 618, 612 if you're lucky. So usually we'll use patching and try and, you know, get mum to, so I'll usually, my spiel, I'll usually use the felt patch. So I usually write down the name of, um, uh, I get, I've got the phone number of the Royal Children's Hospital Pharmacy. They sell, they make these little felt cloth patches or, I'll often tell the mum to get the um, cloth ones over the glasses rather than the adhesive ones, um, but I'll give them all options. And then basically, if it's just not happening and the kid's not um, doing it, I'll tell mum to or dad to get a um, star chart. So get a piece of paper, put it on the fridge and just give a little sticker every time, you know, every day. And then once they accumulate, you know, 10 or, or so stickers, they get a treat. Um, and if it's just not happening, then we'll go with atropin. One drop on a Wednesday, and that's the 1%, just you know, straight from the chemist. One drop on a Wednesday, because it sticks around for two or three days, and then one drop on a Sunday, and do that for um, you know a couple of months, and then get them back and see how we're going. There's a question here, does B12 help other causes of optic neuropathy or just nutritional? There's been a lot of talk about vitamins for glaucoma. It's a good question. I mean, in some other countries, you know, overseas, they're into polypharmacy. They'll just chuck vitamin B at any, you know, if it's a opt MS and optic neuropathy or advanced glaucoma, and they'll just tell the patient, you know, do this, do that. But if we're going evidence-based, there are studies about it. I mean, if the patient's getting it in their diet, they're eating enough meat and various other things, then no, they probably don't need supplementation. So I'm just going to flip to it, some of these questions. Oh, here we go. Someone's saying, what do you do when you make a wrong diagnosis? What if the patient ends up suing? Well, of course, there's always that possibility. If there's good communication, then, um, yeah, we just do our best. The The test in court would normally be, you know, if, if you did all the reasonable investigations. But of course, there's that risk, you know, in any, in any medical practice. But basically, I think good communication with the patient and always having that little disclaimer whenever you, you're unsure or if things aren't adding up to say, look, just come back if anything changes. I think that's the most important thing is to just tell the patient, look, 
if you feel it's still going on or if something's not right, come back. So always keep an open mind and just, yeah, keep pursuing every option and do further investigations. So, um, you know, that's all we can do. Uh, here's another question. Besides being vegetarian, are there other patients who have low B12? Good question. Um, there may be some metabolic or um, other causes for that, but I'm just an ophthalmologist. So most of um, general medicine's <laughs> gone back out of the back of my memory banks. But look, there, there may be some other, you know, metabolic type malabsorption causes for vitamin deficiencies. Oh, someone's um, asking a, a career question here. I'll get on with the presentation and then, yeah, we'll get to that one later. So, accommodative esotropia, of course, is the commonest strabismus we all see. Um, yeah, they usually present about three years old simply because when they're, you know, a baby or a toddler, they're, they've got so much accommodative power up their sleeve. They've got about 14 diopters at birth and then starts to just slowly go, or pretty quickly go down. And then, um, so, you know, a, a little baby could, if they had a plus seven refractive error, they could dial up the plus seven and still have seven up their sleeve to look at near stuff. So they, they don't, they're not straining their accommodation. Um, when they walk in, I, I'll usually explain to the parents that, look, this is um, just a reaction. There's no actual, um, you know, problem with the, the muscles. This child's just, you know, dialing up extra focus power to see the world and that's making their eyes turn in. It's a normal reflex. We all, our eyes all turn in when we look at something very close and I'll, I'll demonstrate it and say she's just dialing up extra to see the world and once we put the glasses in then all of that will relax and should be okay but some of them aren't because they've been stuck like that for so long and then you know a small minority need surgery but it's pretty rare M most accommodative visas in australia we <coughs> catch them early enough that everything can relax back to normal pretty much with glasses and a few do have a residual ESO. um which needs surgery. And of course, most of these kids will need patching as well. There are some very, you know, unusual cases where, or not like surprising cases, and you've probably seen them too, where a little kid will come in aged five with a plus seven or a plus nine refractive error, and there's no ESO at all. Um, I think that's probably because that kid's got an exophoria. So their, accommodate, their accommodation's just bringing it black, back to, to straight. So their ortho, because their eyes are actually, they're just born with eyes that want to go out and the accommodation's pretty good because it's just keeping them straight. That's the only explanation I can think of for some of those surprising kids who come in with the big plus, but no ESO. Okay, so I better get a move on because we're out of time. Congenital ESO is just surgery. Um, yeah, they're pretty obvious and they're all fixed up by the time they're two. Most hospitals will wait till they're one because anaesthetists don't want to give babies GA, general anaesthetic, you know, before the age of 12 months. So we usually wait till they're 18 months or two years old and um, recess the medial rectus muscle on both sides usually. Intermittent exo, many of these kids never get to surgery because it's pretty much a cosmetic decision. Um, being exo doesn't confuse the brain, it seems, and they never get amblyopia. They pretty much always 6'6 in either eye. And um, yeah, so it's really the parent's decision for a little kid. And then when they're older, the adult may wish to get it done pretty much for cosmetic, cosmetic reasons. That's the only time we're sending for surgery. And finally, um, yeah, there are rare types of strabismus, vertical strabismus. Um, Duane syndrome. And the one thing I would say, this is another very memorable case, very intelligent little um, girl in grade six came in with a very good history of diplopia. And it looked like an ESO. When I first saw her just walk in there, I thought, is it just an ESO? Accommodative esotropia, a bit of a late presentation when I saw the age, but she gave a history of diplopia. So then I 
checked the eye movements and she'd had she had a bilateral sixth nerve palsy and I sent her to Monash Medical Center and in fact she did have a brain tumor so some kids do get these um, posterior fossa brain tumors in the back of the brain and yeah she had to go on chemo the whole works so every now and then you will get these things I'll, I'll leave retinoblastoma alone because it's pretty um pretty rare anyway um should I keep going or or I think our time's up isn't it maybe if we could Oh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Um, someone's writing here, what's the opinion of over minus to treat divergent ex divergence excess? Look, it's definitely a thing. Um, it's one of those controversial areas where some people do it, some people don't, some feel it's worthwhile, some feel it's it's you know unfair to the kid to not give them the proper myopic correction. I don't do it myself. I was never trained about that, but I know it's a thing. Um, yeah, I think many ophthalmologists would just give the full minus and then just deal with the strabismus. RB runs in families. There's a big clinic at the children's hospital where they just screen all the siblings routinely. Every four months, they just have a general anesthetic and an examination with dilated pupils in all the siblings in those families because it's a dominant gene. If it's a small one, there's some chemo or cryo or laser. If it's a big tumor, then the eye has to come out. Optic nerve glioma occurs in neurofibromatosis. Um, all NF1 kids will have those leash nodules where they have these little hazel freckles on the iris. So that's um, a, a good one. And maybe 10% or so of kids with NF1 will have some sort of optic nerve glioma, but many of them are pretty small. If it gets too big, then the options are really take the eye out and just put in a fake one if the optic nerve is already gone and compressed to the point that the child's blind anyway. Or if, if it's a small one, there is some um, fancy radiotherapy that can be done to sh where they put a little probe into the orbit in one of the big cancer centers or the children's hospital and try and shrink the tumor. But it's a benign tumor, but its main problem, of course, is that it compresses everything in the orbit, including the optic nerve. Congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Again, the anaesthetists aren't touching this kid until they're at least one year old. So most major hospitals, no one's probing the, the lacrimal duct until they're one. And that's okay because nine out of 10 clear up by the first birthday anyway. So I just tell these parents, just use the Corsig whenever it gets yellow or sticky, come back when they're one and we'll put them on the waiting list at the hospital if it's still watery or sticky at that time. Congenital cataract, I was fortunate to go to Ethiopia and yeah, we did um, cataract surgery on adults, but there was a couple of little kids who came along and um, this kid actually could see after it. So it mustn't have been purely congenital. It must've been acquired. So here's a trick question. Um, do you think this hyena has a retinoblastoma? <laughs> it's got a leukocoria. So that's the clinical sign um, for retinoblastoma, a white pupil. So that's the end of... Um, my talk, I'll just check the Q&A again. Yep, that's it, no open questions. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Hassan. That was you know, definitely really, really interesting. Some really unique cases there. Hopefully nothing that I guess most of us will see, <laughs> but certainly, certainly very, very, very interesting um, to, to look at and to learn about definitely a lot as well. Um, uh, I might just move on. We'll introduce our next speaker of the night, which is Lewis. Uh, so Lewis Curry graduated in 2019 from Deakin after completing a clinical placement in Albany, WA, and also Wellington in New Zealand. Uh, he quickly caught the travel bug and decided to move to Cairns in Queensland, where he currently works alongside an ophthalmologist at the Cairns Eye and Laser Centre. He's also a casual employee for Luxottica. Um, he does have a number of roles at the clinic, uh, including you know, looking at dry eyes, seeing walk-in emergencies, um, other patients who need same-day referrals to ophthalmologists, cross-linking. He's also in charge of the lens calculations for the hospital up there. So he does have special interests in therapeutics and dry eye management. And he also gave his first CPD talk early in the year on quantum molecular resonance and its role in dry eye management. On his days off, I know he enjoys hiking uh, and looking at the many of the waterfall around Cairns, Cairns. Sorry, he's also and also looking at the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so, without further ado, Lewis, do you want to come online for me? Thanks for that, Nick. 
No worries, Louis. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. All right. So thanks for having me, everyone. So my presentation is what it's like as an optometrist working alongside ophthalmology. So a couple of learning objectives for this talk. Um, I want you just to understand common post-op presentations that can occur in ophthalmology practice. It's also a good idea if you can become a bit more confident at prescribing um, certain topical medications, which you can manage post-op complications that you might see in practice, particularly out, if out in rural. Um, I've also added a little bit of a slide on how to troubleshoot cataract patients. This is very helpful if you are doing a one month post-op for the ophthalmologist. Um, and also another learning objective is just to engage in shared care management of ocular health conditions with other um, health practitioners. So this is what my role sort of looks like. Um, as you can see, it, um, there are quite a few roles and that's because I get bored very quickly. Uh, working as an optometrist straight out of uni, it didn't take long before I found it quite repetitive. Um, in saying that though, I did find it really rewarding. Uh, so with my role, it's broken up into each day. Each day is a different theme. So with Monday, I run a dry eye clinic. And now a lot of this is because the doctor doesn't want to see dry eye patients. It's very time consuming. Um, and a lot of it's just counseling the patient. So with this, I start an initial dry eye consultation. Um, a lot of the patients actually come into the clinic don't have dry eye. So that's where I sort of have to triage and send them through to the doctor. Um, other things that we involve here is uh, Oculus KG5 imaging. I do a little bit of IPL, uh, Rexonides, so that's a new technology. It uses alternate electric currents at um, low frequencies um, to stimulate the metabolism of the glands, which produce tears. Other things we do is heat mask and meibomian gland expression. I do a little bit of meibomian gland debri debridement. Recently, I've started lacrimal lavaging a bit more um, and, of course, counselling. So Tuesday, um, today was cataract day. So I actually work as an orthoptist on this day. All of it's one day post-ops, one week post-ops, one month post-ops, um, and then you've got your consultations. So going through the biometry, the pentacam, the specular microscope, which I'll talk a little bit about later, um, education on what cataracts are and how they're removed. Um, you do the handover to the surgeon and then pass through to the bookings manager. Wednesdays and Thursdays, I work as an optometrist, um, a little bit different to the role in primary eye care mainly just doing diabetic reviews, glaucoma reviews. Um, with glaucoma reviews, I've got to be very careful. Um, so according to M NHMRC guidelines, any low risk patient, the doctor just wants to see at least every 12 months. Uh, apart from that, I just pretty much see them six months um, and pass them through to the doctor in the next six months. I do a lot of one month post-ops here. So that's cataracts, pterygium, blepharoplasty, retinopexies, eye stents, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about later. A couple of walk-in emergencies that need same-day referrals. Um, but yeah, and we also do a little bit of choroidal uh, neva. So we get to actually use an ultrasound um, on the eye. And then Friday is mainly injection day. So my role is sort of reviewing and managing macloedema, um, more macloedema and a little bit more. Other roles though, we run outreach clinics. So they're just in the local communities. So a lot of indigenous population around Cairns that can't actually get down to Cairns. So we go out there for them. Um, I do a little bit of corneal cross-linking uh, alongside the visiting retinal specialist. That's epithelium on with boost goggles. I also uh, work alongside a retinal specialist that comes up um, once every three months. I do a little bit of imaging, um, lens calculations, which is a little bit boring. <laughs> Cairns-based hospital admin, um, triaging, referrals, and discharge letters. So here's a couple of photos of the clinic. Um, that's me. In the top picture, just doing a bit of corneal cross-linking, top right to my consult room. But um, the practice is quite big. We probably take through anywhere from 60 to 80 patients a day. On the days where I'm just seeing patients as an optometrist, I probably see about 30. So being a primary, um, being a secondary practice, our main three procedures we actually see is probably cataract surgery, intravitreal injections, and a lot of glaucoma management. And as you can predict the main complications that can arise are corneal edema, macular edema, and uncontrolled high IOP. So I'm gonna spend my presentation just going through how I manage a few of these conditions and my role. So a little bit about cataract surgery is one of the safest and most common medical procedures in the world. 
has about a 95% success rate of those that go wrong. Um, as long as you're following up at the one day, one week, one month review, you can often pick up um, the concerns. So the main complications include inflammation, whether that's at the front of the eye or the back of the eye. About 1% of patients going through cataract surgery will have macular edema. Um, for this, they'll focus on corneal edema. So this is a very helpful slide. Well, I hope it is. Um, so this is how I troubleshoot a cataract patient. I want you just to be aware that you could use this slide if say doing a one month post-op for a doctor in a rural setting, because a lot of patients do struggle to come back for that one day, one week and one month. So firstly, what I do is I start by measuring vision. Um, so here I'm paying particular attention to the speed at which the patient reads. Um, I also measure the letters on a black background against a white background. It gives you an idea of glare sensitivity. Um, it could indicate a compromised tear film, um, for instance, severe post-operative dry eye. So what do I do if the patient has vision that's less than 6.6 at one month? So first, I want to check back at the doctor's notes, check for a gutter prognosis. A lot of patients will have things like amblyopia, Fuchs dystrophy, um, or epiretinal membranes. I then just check the lens design. Is it toric or non-toric? The main reason I check this, if it's toric, I'm going to dilate all patients. If it's non-toric, depending on the age, you probably get a good view of the posterior eye health. I then perform a quick objective and subjective refraction. The main thing I'm looking for is for high seal. So high seal often always indicates that the toric lens has rotated, but it's also a good idea to check things like near vision um, in a multifocal lens design. So if distance vision is a bit better than what you would expect, like say 6, 4.5, you might actually find the near vision is a little bit less. Nat might actually talk a little bit about that later on with, when she goes through lens options. So what I do next, if I still can't work out what's going on, I dilate and perform an OCT. I pretty much do this on any patient that doesn't achieve 6.6. Um, and then an anterior and posterior eye exam. So common things you're going to come across is PCO, corneal edema, um, post-operative dry eye. Less common is infections at a big one, endophthalmitis, dislocated ILL or retinal abnormalities. Um, Lastly, I check the toric marking. So this is where I've always got to and I found out the lens is rotated. I chuck them through to the doctor and he might have to um, perform the surgery again. Uh, thankfully, I've never had to recheck the lens calculation. That's because we cross-check it on two machines before four staff members cross-check the results. And finally, the doctor cross-checks and makes the final selection. So we have a pretty good system. So this is how I manage corneal edema. Um, up there, you've got a couple of little definitions of what steroids and NSAIDs are. I'm not going to focus too much on that. We actually use a specular microscope for all cataract patients. Um, so it's really good at looking at the endothelial cell count. Um, and you can actually predict whether a patient's going to be more susceptible to corneal edema after the operation. So when I'm dosing a patient at the one-day post-op, I think of vision as an indicator for dosing schedule. All patients actually start on a levro, so that's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drop. Um, whether it's night or morning, it will differ depending on the doctor. Um, and then we also start them on Maxidex or Pred for at least four times a day. However, if visions say less than 618 and I check the interior eye and I see quite a few cells, and quite a few stromal edema, I might chuck them on every two hours um, and get them back in a week. So what do I do at one week if vision hasn't improved? Um, so vision it has improved, sorry, I might just taper off the steroid over a three-week period, or if they've already been placed on every two hours, we might just drop it down to four times a day. Um, if it's at one week and it has deteriorated, I actually um, might think about prescribing an alternative medication. So whether you go a preservative-free um, drop um, or this Japanese one I use called Ripple Sigil, um, so that's an off-label one. It's actually used for glaucoma management overseas in Japan. Uh, we dose it about four times a day, and usually in patients that have vision less than, say, 690, and get them back in a week and you actually see very good results. I've chucked in Optimel there as well. I actually had a, um, a little bit of a talk to Nat, who is speaking next, and Optimel is really good at epitheliization, um, so it can actually be used as an adjunctive therapy to manage corneal edema. And if there's still no improvement, I'll handball it through to the doctor. So this is a specular microscope. Um, as we're young, we have a really high cell count. And as we get a little bit older, the cell count decreases. 
So the normal range is about 1500 to 3500. So if we were to do this at the one day and seven day post-op, you can actually see what it would look like there. However, we really just do it before the procedure. And if they've got a cell count less than say 1500, you can predict that they might um, have a little bit more corneal edema than average. The other procedure we do a lot of these intravitreal injections. So the main ones we do is um, ALEA, but we also do other things like Ozidex. So that's a steroid injection. Um, the main complications that actually arise with this is pain. You get the foreign body sensation. We try and give a lot of our patients um, lubricants prior to the injection just to prevent that. Get watery eyes, some corneal abrasions and your hemorrhages. Very rarely do we see severe um, complications. I've probably seen one case of end up from either since working there. Um, but yeah, apart from that, it's pretty safe. So when managing macular edema, the main thing you want to work out is what's actually causing the edema. Is it surgery? Is it a vein occlusion, uncontrolled diabetes? So if it's surgery, often we can pop them on what's um, the Allevro drop again, really good for post-operative macular edema as well, sort of the best drop. Uh, apart from that, if it's uncontrolled diabetes or vein occlusion, I get the doctor involved because there's probably something going on systemically that um, they can treat. So post-op macular edema, what I do is I chuck them back on the Allevro, also the Maxidex about four times a day, I get them back in a month. So a lot of the time this resolves it and it's great. So what do I do? I just take them off and get them back for another short one month review. And if edema is um, worse, I pop them through for an injection for the doctor. If it's better, I might just push the review back to say two months and slowly push it back to say six until I'm confident that it, the macula is nice and stable. So always just be um, conservative. It's also helpful if you can know the frequency and the type of medication that's used. For instance, knowing that a patient's getting a LEA, you can expect that their vision could drop, um, say, after four weeks. That's how uh, long the injections sort of last for. Ozidex, on the other hand, is a steroid. So it's an Ozidex implant, slow release of steroid over a long period of time. Usually we get these patients uh, for another one every sort of four to six months. However, you've got to be aware that this is a steroid. So you actually have to set short reviews in a lot of cases to monitor IOP. When reviewing the OCT scans before an injection, it's always important to review vision, of course. Um, that's a no-brainer. So for instance, if I see a reduction in vision and no fluid, I'm a little bit concerned. So what I do is I just set a small review and get them back in a couple of weeks. If I see a reduction in vision with only mild fluid, and say if I see this mild fluid um, where the doctor wouldn't inject, if I see the drop of vision associated with it, I'm going to be more inclined to pass it through to the doctor um, for a possible injection. The other week, I actually had a case where fluid didn't even resolve with long-standing injections and I passed it through to the doctor and he said it was a case of chronic macular edema. And I said, oh, what's that? And I haven't really seen much of that. Um, and what he did was pop the patient on oral medication, so prednisolone tablets. And similar to drops, he tapers these patients down over time. Um, however, this can actually be done over months. These patients that go through a lot, of, um, a lot of this with prednisone tablets have quite poor vision though. Lastly, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on glaucoma management. So we sort of have five main procedures we do. We do a lot of eye stents. Um, so that's an implant uh, to help with the drainage, often performed during cataract surgery. SLT, that's one of the gold standards uh, for lowering pressure. So selective laser projectilectomy. Peripheral iridotomy is very good for patients um, at risk of closed angle coma or have a closed angle. Um, trabeculoplasty, often only see that when all of the above go wrong. And recently we've got a cyclodiode laser. So end stage glaucoma. Very rarely do we want to um, use this on patients. Uh, but it's mainly used to um, laser away at the ciliary body to stop it producing aqueous. These patients often have terrible vision, but they've got all those symptoms of the nausea, the real bad eye pain. So we just want to take that away for the patient, and make it a lot more manageable for them. So managing high IOP and troubleshooting in difficult situations. I think the most difficult situation I've been in is when the doctor's on leave because I'm there for two weeks with no one to sort of help me except the doctor on phone. Um, so the highest I IOP I've ever seen was actually 65 um, and the patient came in with none of the normal symptoms. They just said, my eye didn't feel quite right. 
So obviously history taking is vital. Ask about the brow ache, the headaches, the glare sensitivity, nausea, vomiting. Um, this patient had none of that, a little bit glare sensitive. Know the order and how to prescribe anti glaucoma medication. So we were drilled on this in uni. Um, start with your prostaglandin analogs, work your way down. Um, you can always add some together. It's always good to know contraindications when prescribing. So think of the really common ones like asthma and soft allergy. Um, and you should also know that a lot of combination drops actually are combined with Timolol. So try and avoid them in asthmatics where possible. The alternative here, a common one, is Syngrinza. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Diamox. Um, I actually prescribe a lot of Diamox um, with the doctor's approval, of course. If a nurse is on and I want to prescribe it and the doctor's not there, I'll just send him a text um, or try and get in contact with him. But he's usually pretty comfortable. So with Diamox, it's actually a drug that's used for altitude sickness. Uh, funnily enough, the symptoms of Diamox often include dizziness, lightheadedness, nausea, um, and the symptoms of altitude sickness are pretty similar. So when I prescribe this to a patient, I'll either chuck them on just one tablet a day or two a day. I won't ever go too extreme with four a day like the doctors sometimes do. Um, apart from that, I just educate them that they might get the metallic taste, increased urination. It's a diuretic. Um, and just be very wary that they don't have anything like a sulfur allergy. Um, sometimes you won't have access to a doctor, so you could also communicate to, say, a GP if you are really concerned about high eye pressure and working in a rural setting. Phone an ophthalmologist if you know one. Uh, they would be very um, happy to give approval for you to prescribe Diamox or at least organise a prescription for you. Uh, one case I had on this was when the doctor was on leave. It was a Thursday. Luckily, they were coming back Monday. Um, the patient had failed eye stent surgery. They're already on um, some anti glaucoma medication. The pressures came in and it was about 40. So what I did was I gave him enough Diamox to a day until Monday, got him back first thing on Monday, um, swapped Zalatan to Zalacom and, and also added a um, combination drop like some Brinza. So really trying to tackle it hard. So in summary, um, manage post-op macular edema where possible. Uh, the health system these days is becoming quite crowded. Even as a private practice, it's really crowded where we are. Um, so that's why I sort of have a role in trying to manage macular edema, see actually whether they need an injection or if we can leave it for say another week or two. Uh, apart from that, shared care and decision-making is key. So like I said, if you are comfortable, try and uh, find a way to prescribe alternative medication and just communicate as much as you can. And lastly, hopefully you got this message throughout the presentation. Don't be afraid to prescribe. I was very afraid when I first started. I had no idea, to be honest. Um, but as long as you always use an evidence-based approach, you know the contraindications of the medication. And most importantly, set really small reviews in case you need to reconsider your therapeutic management. You'll be more than okay. Um, so that pretty much wraps up my presentation. I've got a couple of references there. Um, but apart from that, does anyone have any questions? Oh, there's probably lots of questions. Let me just double check. Um, Louis, we've just actually saved them for you all at the end for the Q&A. Oh, excellent. Thank you for that. Thanks for that present presentation, Lewis. Um, it's really, really interesting. I think a lot of us are like, you're living like the best of both worlds with your job. So it's pretty cool. Um, so now we're on to our last presenter for the night. So our presenter is Miss Natalie Buckman. Natalie is a, the Queensland Refractive Account Manager for Alcon. She supports ophthalmologists and their clinical staff in achieving the best possible refractive outcomes through mm -hmm. clin clinical support, such as IOL calculations and surgical support. Natalie has consulted in both corporate and independent optometry practices, ophthalmology practices, and has assisted with teaching of the, of the optometry program um, at QUT. So for our working with ophthalmology webinar, Natalie will be discussing
Thanks, Natalie, for that presentation. That was really interesting. Um, so again, if anyone has any questions about that presentation, we'd like you to invite, we'd like to invite you to use the QA box and we'll save them and get to them soon. Um, so in terms of the presentations, that's all we have time for today. It's been a really interesting session and thank you to our listeners for tuning in and participating in today's webinar. Um, we'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers tonight for their insightful presentations. Um, sorry, my video is just <laughs> off at the moment, but it is me, Nick. Um, so just before we get to the final Q&A, there are just a few things we'd like to run through. Um, so importantly, very soon in the chat, we will put through a survey link for Qualtrics. Um, so in that link, we would really love any feedback that you could give us. And also we'll need to fill it out to get your CPD points as well. Um, so again, that will come through in the chat very, very soon. Um, I think Ash has just sent it just then. Um, and we also ask that we have recently started a LinkedIn page. So please, if you can give us a follow on there. And you can also stay connected with us through Instagram as well. Um, if you've changed your contact details recently, please head to the alumni, Deacon Alumni website so you can change your details because we'd love to be able to stay in touch with you. Um, I know a lot of you do see us on Facebook as well. But just a reminder that we're on Instagram and now LinkedIn. Um, so just back over to you, Ashna. So finally, it's come to that time of the year where we announced that we're also looking for some new recruits for the Deakin Alumni Committee. So if you're thinking of joining our great team, keep an eye out on um, the social media, media pages as we'll be advertising that shortly. So we'll head into the Q&A. So if we could get our speakers to just turn their cameras on and unmute. Perfect. <clears throat> So we'll start off with you, Dr. Hassan. We had a question come in about what your view was on laser surgery for high prescriptions. Yes, so laser vision correction works up to about minus 10, depending on the thickness of the cornea, and maybe up to about plus six. Anything beyond that needs refractive lens exchange. Um, I had one lady that was minus 20, and she just yeah, just didn't want to wear glasses. She couldn't tolerate contact lenses. She had a little kid and she just was always dropping her glasses. So, and too much edge distortion. So in her case, I I don't normally do refractive cases, but in her particular case, I just thought I'll, I will. So I did a refractive lens exchange and speaking of the EDOFs that Natalie was talking about, the extended depth of focus IOL. So I put one eye aiming for a minus 0 0.5 because the EDOF you know, it'll give you about a, up to one on either side anyway, or half at least. So I am minus 0 0.5 in one eye, in the right eye. And then in the left eye, I aimed for a minus 1.2 or something like that. But with the EDOF giving you an extra half or so, you know, it'll get her to about a minus two. Uh, um, so she was happy. She could do most things. But if she's going to sit and read a book, then, yeah, she'd need reading glasses to balance them up. So... Going back to the EDOF thing, for private, public hospitals don't have them. So basically everyone's going to just get, you know, they're going to aim for Plano and each eye with a monofocal normal IOL. But for all my private patients now, I use an EDOF lens and I'll go, I'll aim zero in one eye. And then depending on their hobbies, I'll, I'll either aim zero or a minus 0 0.75 or even a minus one in the second eye. I had one old fellow who's a builder, so I was going to offer him for the second eye to um, go minus one, but so he could see his tools when he's working, but he's semi-retired and he's got a Ferrari apparently because I was asking about his hobbies and he, he goes to the racetrack and drives his Ferrari every weekend. So definitely in him, I went zero, zero. If someone's operating a crane or driving into state, then it's, it's no question. They just go zero, zero, both eyes. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks for that, Dr. Hassan. Um, so for Lewis, have you ever had the opportunity to perform like under supervision, obviously, anti badger or No, uh, not yet. Um, <laughs> I have actually had the opportunity to perform a YAG laser though. Um, that was just done on someone that worked with us that did surgery. And I was like, oh, oh let, let pick me. Um, <laughs> so I got to do theirs. 
but um, it's pretty easy. It's just like playing a video game. Um, but yeah. Cool. And um, for Natalie. So, so back to you, back to you, Dr. Hassan. I've got, besides being a vegetarian, are there any other patients who might have a low B12? There are very rare things, you know, in, intestinal malabsorption, you know, some people have had their small bowel cut out, you know, things like that. But, you know, on a normal diet here in Australia, people are eating, you know, unless they're vegan or they're, you know, alcoholic or, you know, some toxicities. But yeah, there, there are rare things. That's more for the general physicians and surgeons. Yeah. But yes, intestinal malabsorption. And I've just got another one for you as well, Louis. Um, so I've got, uh, someone's put in, I'm interested in working alongside an ophthalmologist. How difficult or different would you say the application process is to work in the field compared to working in other fields like retail slash general optom? Um, you know, they're asking about well, kind of what needs to be on your resume, portfolio, any different qualifications, even maybe Dr. Hassan, you could answer some things if you work with any optoms, but yeah. Uh, I think it really depends on where you are, to be honest. Um, I didn't have an application process. I just had the doctor book him for an eye test. Um, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> uh, and he took me out for a brickie. So it was pretty good. Uh, apart from that, um, if you want a job, we've got plenty of opportunities. So you can uh, let me know. Uh, but um, yeah, it's pretty, it, it will depend on where you are. Another thing is recently a lot of ophthalmologists are pushing to hire more optometrists as opposed to orthoptists. And the reason being that we attach um, Medicare billing. Um, so pretty much we can provide our own wage for them and they don't have to pay as much. Um, but yeah, um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I've worked in a couple of practices over the years where they've had optometrists, mostly laser vision correction. So. I used to work at Dr. Wolf's clinic and also Dr. Alpins and both of them who were big laser vision correction practices definitely had an optometrist. So they'd get them to see all their LASIK patients, you know, do all the workup, see them post-op. Um, I guess, yeah, of course, optometrists are more skilled with that sort of thing. So, so that's the main time I've seen it. But again, in a remote place like Cairns, yeah, there's so many patients and there's, so I think in the remote country locations, there'd be more opportunity for that sort of thing or in a laser vision practice. Because in, in the country, there's just too many patients and not enough ophthalmologists. So they need all hands on deck to get through the workload. Yep. Um, and then just moving back to you, Nat. Uh, thumbs up. Did you notice a pulsing eye with the carotid cavernous fistula? No, it, it, it wasn't that big. If it was a high flow one, then it might get, it might get to that stage. In this particular case, the, the, if you look on the slit lamp, the vessels, if you look carefully, you, you know, with the eye of faith, you'd see maybe a slight pulsation of the arterialized subconscious vessels. But it wasn't very obvious. But yes, in a, in a very high flow one you, or a higher flow one, you, you could see the arterial pulsation under the slit lamp. Okay, thank you. And for Lewis, what tonometer do you use in practice? So do you typically go for an eye care or any other one? Yeah, so I actually use all three. Um, it sort of differs um, depending on the case though. So for instance, if I'm reviewing a glaucoma patient for one of the doctors, like an SLT or a a peripheral iridotomy. I'm going to go straight to the Goldman um, and use their rooms. In my room, I've only got a Perkins and an eye care. Um, so I'll pretty much use eye care on everyone still. It's pretty accurate. Um, if it does flag up something high uh, for just a general eye test, I'll check, um, I'll use a Perkins just to double check it. But a lot of the time when I use eye care for say the doctor's workups only, um, he pretty much gets identical results um, on Goldman. Another thing just to consider is uh, if you do have high um, result on an eye care, just check the CCT, um, the corneal thickness, and then I do a little calculation to take off or add what the pressure should be for the doctor. Perfect. And for Natalie, what's the selection? In your, ex in your, yeah. in your experience, in your ex rotate back to you, Dr. Hassan. I've got a few questions coming up about carotid cavernous fistula, I think, since you mentioned it. <laughs> so I'll just ask two together. So the first person has asked, 
do you palpate the eye when you suspect the carotid cavernous fistula to check the pressure? Um, and also they've asked how frequently would you wish to review the patient after they're treated slash you're looking for any, you know, post-op complications or anything else after that? The post-op, I mean, once they're good, it means they've closed it and they've called it. So I might see them one more time in a couple of months just to check the pressure, make sure that, you know, it's not creeping back or anything like that. And like with a lot of these things, you see them first, maybe, you know, three months later, then maybe six months later, then one year later, and then just discharge them back to the optometrist and, or, and just tell them to come back if anything goes bad. Um, the first question, palpating the eye. Again, if you can't see pulsation on the slit lamp, I mean, if it's a big one that's really, you know, the, the, you know, the backflow of blood's enough to make the whole orbit, you know, throbbing, then you, you'll pretty much see it. So no, I mean, the, you could try, but it, it'd have to be a pretty bad case and you'd probably just see it on the slit lamp if it was to that level, yeah. Yep, yep, thank you. Um, and for Louis, uh, just on that slide, you were talking about getting patients down to 6'6 six, six post-op. Uh, someone's asked, you know, approximately what percentage of patients do you feel need to have that kind of that checklist that you set out done? Like how often do you get past the, you know, they're not seeing 6'6, six, six, let's do the rest of it. Um, it's actually a pretty um, high amount actually achieve 6.6. Six. Often we'll get patients achieve in 6.4.5, at least with both eyes um, and 6.6 six on their own. I think majority of patients though um, have pre-existing conditions like epiretinal membranes or Fuchs dystrophy or even dry eye. So a lot of time we're trying to manage those patients prior to the surgery, particularly dry eye patients, because it's just exacerbated after the surgery. Um, but yeah, I don't actually know the statistic. I guess we could do a little study at work, but um, that's just more work for me. <laughs> yes, you, I think you've got plenty <laughs> by, the, <laughs> by the sounds of things. Um, and then Natalie, I've got a question for you. So for Dr. Hassan, are there any known treatment and management options for visual snow as some patients find it very distracting? And also what's the prevalence of people who notice entopic phenomenon? and any populations who are more likely to experience that? As I said, I've noticed that it's usually young guys, you know, often unemployed or just, yeah, very, you know, I don't know. I, it, it seems to be the young, yeah, teenagers, young men that I've noticed who are aware of it. I'm, I'm sure that it's, it's still there in everybody else as well. In terms of treatments, ophthalmologically, no, there's no treatment. If you start Googling, then yes, neurologists are going to start trying anti-epileptic drugs and antidepressants and this and that, which I think is excessive and not worth the side effects because I'd be very surprised if it made any difference. So, look, I think these are just, yeah, the background workings of the eye, patients perceiving them. That's that's what I think. Look, I may be wrong. Maybe, you know, there are other, you know, doctors who have more information about it, but... It, And with the antoptic phenomenon, do you know any particular populations who experience it more? Or? I don't think there's any racial predilection for it or anything like that. Um, as I say, I think young people just notice it because they're young and it's the first time they've noticed it. Um, and yeah, and they got maybe, yeah, they're just aware. Um, that's all I'd say. But I, I think everybody's got to be just... Like I can make myself see visual snow if I want to. I think yeah. you could too. <laughs> Perfect. And um, for Lewis, is there any particular reason why um, Ilea is used as a preferred anti vegf with you all? Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess the a few of them are actually um, not PBS or not associated with the PBS. Um, it, I don't know. It just has a good review, but that, probably a good question for the doctor. <laughs> our retinal specialist in, in the clinic where I work also uses ILEA. I think it's also practicality because I think it comes with its own needle. You don't have to, um, it's like easier because they're doing so many of them. It's just, I think, more efficient. Um, it was advertised as lasting longer than Lucentis. It was supposed to be that it lasts for six weeks rather than four weeks. That was the whole thing. But then there's a lot of studies come out saying they're all about the same. So I think it actually boils down to that it's just packaged, easier to use, yeah, more efficient. 
if that answers your question. <laughs> okay, so we just might jump back to Dr. Hassan. Um, sorry, I know that first question for Louis. Uh, so someone's just asked, it's another question about nutritional optic neuropathy. Um, they've asked what, what would suitable treatment for people with nutritional optic neuropathy or would you treat the underlying nutritional etiology? A hundred percent. They have to get some vitamin B into them. So if they'll take the tablets, it's the tablets. Um, working down in Wanthaggy where Ash is, I had one lady from Phillip Island. Yeah, she was. She she told me. She said, "Look, I'm I'm an alcoholic." Like she, like I said this. You know, I asked her, uh, "What about the grog?" What? And then she um she was a real full on alcoholic, not eating properly, living alone. So she she needed a social worker. I actually, just rang her GP and said, "Look, is there someone can go?" You know, because she wasn't going to get better if she, the way she was going at all. So, but yeah, if it's just a dietary thing, then. Yes, the tablets first, and if not, then they get injections. So the GP can give a monthly injection of B12. And yes, you have to fix the under... So, you know, I saw in the comments someone was saying there was an anorexic patient with it as well. So, yeah, they'd need admission to hospital to, to treat the underlying problem. How quickly do you give out that, that vitamin? Do you say, look, go to the campus now, you know, grab it? Yeah, or... yeah, yeah, that's what I did with the patient last week. I, I gave her a script. And I just said, go to the chemist, get some vitamin B12 and B, just multi B and, um, and see. And then I wrote a letter to the GP for them to follow it up and to actually do serum B12 levels. You can do a blood test for it to measure. Right. So I, I wrote a letter to the GP to follow it up and also brought the patient back in a month to double check their vision. Yeah. Do you know how long it takes? So obviously you saw them in the month and I assume things were better. The last lady I saw about five years ago who was worse than this one, she had swollen discs, 660 vision. It took maybe three, four months for her to come back up. And then at the six month visit, she was 66 again. The discs had all gone back down to normal. So they, they looked like full on papilledema and they were perfectly normal after okay. six yeah, so it take a bit of time then. I guess it depends on how deficient they were. Yeah, and she was a bad case. So I'd expect this one within maybe three months will be okay. Yep, yep. awesome. Then, so this will be the last question just for Lewis. Um, so I've got a question about Diamox. So have you had anyone have an adverse reaction such allergy to Diamox? And so what have you done in this case? I understand it can have pretty severe side effects you know some patients just really don't want to tolerate it and also you're fighting with them over their pressures have you had to be in that scenario before no i've never had really adverse side effects um, i actually had a patient today who was on it um, and she was saying she had the worst side effects ever so i actually asked her what side effects just in case you asked this question <laughs> <laughs> um, but her main ones were nausea um, she felt very dizzy fatigued um, she had some pins and needles in the tip of her, tips of her fingers um, and she just had that metallic taste and increased urination, urination. But besides that, I've never seen it. When would you start that Diamox? Like a patient came in with pressures of, you know, 40 to 50, are you going to try drops? Or are you going to get straight to the Diamox? Pretty much generally over 30, I would might chuck them on um, Diamox, yep. maybe just one tablet, particularly if they come in for like one day post-ops um, today and they haven't actually taken the, medication after the surgery because um, a lot of them are sort of still a little bit out of it after the twilight surgery yep. so i might just give them one diamox in the morning and then they'll see the doctor in an hour or two um, for the post-op yep do you know if it uh, mixes unwell with any other meds like systemic um i guess because it's um yeah i guess you couldn't use it if they had things i don't know with Diamox, it used to be a thing in the old days that they'd get a tablet after surgery routinely. So when they used to do, you know, much bigger surgery before FACO, everyone would get Diamox for 24 hours. Um, so it's a diuretic. So if you're on, if you're already on fluid tablets, you might lose a bit too much potassium. So when I'm putting someone on Dimox for a while, like if it's just, as Lewis said, just for a couple of days after post-op, just for that pressure spike, then it's fine. You don't have to do anything. But if I've got a patient where you've given them all the drops under the sun and they're waiting for their trabeculectomy and the pressure is still too high, then you have to add Dimox. And if they're going to be on it for a few weeks till they get their surgery, 
then you got to add some potassium every day because it depletes your potassium. So basically bananas have a lot of potassium. So I'll just tell them to eat one or two bananas daily or they can get some, um, yeah, if they don't like bananas, then they can get some um, <laughs> potassium tablets from the chemist if they're going to yes. be on it for a few weeks. Yeah, right. And, yeah, and, right. I, and I tell them, I warn them in advance that the tingling fingers, the tingling lips, that's standard. It's just part of the medicine doing its thing. It's That's almost universal. But as Lewis said, the tummy upsets are more to the point that that sometimes puts people off to yeah but then apart but yeah it, you'd have to be on it for a long time to get proper potassium depletion and things like that yeah yeah perfect um look it's it's coming up to, to nine o'clock at the moment so i just would quickly like to wrap up and say just a massive thank you to dr hassan lewis and natalie for for taking time out of your night we really do appreciate you guys coming online and sharing all your wisdom and the weird and wonderful. Um, very, 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 very interesting to, to see everything and learn everything about those lenses coming in as well, Nat. Um, as I said before, I hope not to see it. Well, I would like to see it. I don't want to see it, you know, too much. But, yeah, it's just super interesting to see what you guys deal with on, you know, maybe a week to week rather than day to day. Um, as you guys, for the, everyone else listening in, there is a feedback survey by Qualtrics sitting in your chat. So please fill that out if you can to get your CPD and also give us some feedback. We really would love to hear from you regarding any future topics that you guys would like to cover because we do want to bring something that everyone's interested in. Um, and also you will hear from us soon regarding applications for coming into the alumni team. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, there's a quiz as well to be available next Tuesday or it's available until open till next Tuesday for you guys to complete. But thanks so much, everyone. Um, and thank you again to your, our speakers. You guys have been absolutely great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.